today I want to talk to you about um, what it means to be truly successful in this life. And um, I want to talk about uh, delighting in the Lord and declaring the Lord and depending on him and being truly devoted to him and uh, also being driven or motivated by him in, in our lives. And um, the goal is that we would be truly faithful to the Lord uh, as we live. And uh, we began a sermon series on um, Ephesians last week, and Lord willing, we'll continue next week. Uh, providentially, I was speaking at the CM service, and this message seemed appropriate for them, and it seems appropriate for you as well. And so, and it leads us into the next verses in the book of Ephesians anyway. And so, please... Um, Please hear God's word. We're in Psalm 78. I'm just going to be reading the first eight verses. It's a rather long psalm. It's 72 verses, but we'll be looking at those verses as we move our way through the sermon, Lord willing. Uh, please hear God's word. Uh, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should, be, they should, not, should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Now, as you uh, listen to those verses, it seems evident that um, um, it's talking, in some sense, primarily to, to parents, and in particular to fathers. And, uh, but before you check out and, and say, well, it doesn't apply to me, uh, please remember that uh, one day you probably will be parents. And uh, you see how it says in verse uh, 6, it says so that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn. And so, in large part, this passage can be used by you to prepare your own heart so that you would be walking with God so that when, if the Lord chooses to give you children, and even if he doesn't choose to give you children, you have influence in the life of those who are of the next generation. And so, um, what we, we have here is a long history, as you can see in this, uh, of Israel's history. And uh, if you've read through this uh, before, it's not a very pretty history. Um, but every single uh, one of you, every single parent, and uh, every single child, you've got dreams for your life and for the life of your children. You've got goals that you want to set for them, and you've got goals that you set for yourself. There's a certain way in which you uh, want to influence them and impact their life. Uh, most parents today, and even most children today, you have great hopes. Um, some of you have hopes to get excellent grades in school and to get a good education and a good job and make uh, a lot of money so you can get the things you like, like a house and get a spouse and have children. Some of you may even want to be famous here. And um, you may want wealth, and we all want good health. And um, your parents want you to get good grades. I know that's right. And um, they want you to have the ability to speak and write in Chinese. Um, it's very important to, to them, and maybe to you as well. But I want to talk to you today about the thing that is um, uh, the most important thing that you can give your children, 
the most important thing that, that you and I can have for ourselves. And that without this one thing, you can have all that other stuff and you still will be a failure. You can, you can have all of those things like good health and a good job and good money and all those things, but, but if you don't have this one thing, your parenting and your life is a flunk. It's a failure. This one thing is, is like, it's like a treasure that a man found in a, in, a, in a field. And he dug it up and he looked at it. It was, it was priceless. And so he put it back in the field and covered it up. And he went away and in joy, he sold everything he owned just to buy that field. This one thing is so precious and so priceless. It's like a merchant who, 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 who is in the business for buying jewelry and buying pearls. And, and uh, he's always looking for a fine piece of jewelry. And, and he finds a pearl of so much value that he sells every single thing he owns just to get that one pearl. This thing is priceless. You can't live without it. And this thing is the gospel. It's, 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 it's knowing what God has done through Jesus Christ by his spirit for his glory. That nothing is more important than this in your life. No hope, no dream will ever match this. This is in a category all by itself. It is the most precious thing of all. You see it there in verse 4. It says that now, the fathers didn't hide these things from their children, but they told the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. And it says he established a testimony in Jacob. You know what a testimony is. It's something to, it's something to talk about. It's something to tell someone about. And what God has done through his son, by his spirit, for his people, is something to talk about. And, and, and what, what, what this author here wants to do is he, he says, give ear, O my people, incline your heart. He wants to sow a word in your heart. He wants to plant a word in your heart so much that it will grow. And it will grow to the point where, where, where you sow it in the heart of your children. And, and, and they sow it in the heart of your grandchildren. And it goes on and on. Because what God wants, finally, is he wants the whole earth to be filled with the knowledge of his glory, just like the waters cover the sea. That's what God is into. That's his mission in this world. That's why he has you in this world. He wants to sow this word. He's the sower. And he wants to sow this word in your heart. And then he wants to take you and sow you in this world so that you would be light and you would be salt and you would reflect his beauty to the nations and be attractive and draw people to Jesus Christ so that they might be saved. That's his great grand plan for you. That was his plan for Israel in the Old Testament. He, he delivered his people out of Egypt. And he brought them into the promised land. He brought them into a land that was in the middle of three continents. Because he wanted everybody to see what redeemed people look like. He wanted everybody to see what redeemed living looked like. He wanted to put his people on display and say, this is, these are saved people. This is what they look like. And he wanted the nations to look into it and say, this is attractive. And they wanted to, he wanted to see the nations run to these of his people and, and learn his ways so that his name might be proclaimed in all the world. That's, that was his great dream. That was his great hope. But you see, in, in verse 9, something very strange happens. It says in verse 9 that the Ephraimites, they were armed with a bow, but they turned back on the day of battle. You know, you know the Ephraimites, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. He was an Ephraimite. And it says that the Ephraimites, they were armed. They, they knew the Lord. They had been saved. They were ready for battle. But somehow they put their weapon down. And they didn't live for the, the fame of God. They didn't live for the name of God. That wasn't that important to them. They, they had some other desires driving them. They, they put their weapon down. 
you understand the weight of what's happening. God put him in the land to make a name for him, to be a display people for the nations, but, but they put their weapon down. But the Bible says in, in Judges chapter 2 that Joshua died. He was 110 and, and all the generation died. But then there arose another generation after them. And it says of that generation, they didn't know the Lord. And they didn't know what he did for Israel. They, 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 and that's what happens here. It says, if you keep reading in verse 10 of chapter 78, they forgot the covenant. They broke the covenant with God. They refused to obey his commandments. You know, they're, they're not supposed to obey to get saved. They, they're to, to, to obey because they were saved. And, and they were supposed to, in their obedience, reflect the very character of God to the nations, that they would be attracted to them. The world is dark, and, and they were supposed to be a light to the nations, but they put their weapon down. They, they broke covenant. They refused to obey. And the reason why, the Bible says, is because they forgot. Look at it. It says there in verse 10 and 11, they forgot the works of God. They forgot the wonders of God. They forgot what he did in Egypt. And it talks about, as it goes on, it talks about how, how God in Egypt, he, he divided the Red Sea. He, he led them through the sea. They forgot about it. He led them in the wilderness with a pillar of fire and a pillar of light. They forgot all about it. And, 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 he, and, he, and, he, and they had rocks in the desert, you know. There's not a whole lot of water in the desert. And they, they were thirsty in the desert. And, and at one time, uh, God told Moses, hit the rock. He said, I'm going to stand on the rock and, and hit the rock. Hit me. And the rock split and water gushed out like an ocean. And they drank and they were satisfied. And they sang his praise, but they forgot about him. So they put their weapon down. They weren't delighting in the Lord. They weren't overjoyed about the Lord. And because they didn't delight in the Lord, they, they didn't declare the Lord. How about you? Do, do you? do you allow God to sow his word in your heart? Uh, to such a degree so that God can sow you in this world so that you might sow his word in the hearts of other people so that God can sow them in the world and they can sow the word of God in some other people's heart so that there will be a great company of people who fill the world with the glory of the Lord. Is that the way you live life or is that your priority? Is that the thing that's most important to you? Is that the thing that drives you? Is that the thing that moves you? Is that the thing that wakes you up in the morning? It's got to be you were created to delight in the Lord. You were created to declare the Lord and, and to make him famous. That's why you are, exist now. That's why God gave you life, to make him famous. It's all about making God famous. Not only with your lips, but with your lives. It's about being on display for the world to see your good deeds and give glory to God. Give praise to God. Give honor and give blessing and celebration to God. That's why you exist. That's why God saved you. That's why God sends you into this world. It's to delight in him and to declare him so that the nations might see and behold the wonders of God. They might be saved. But that's not what Israel did. They forgot about it. Keep reading. It talks about how uh, in verse uh, 17, even though they saw these works, they sinned even more. They rebelled against the Most High in the desert. It says they tested God in their heart. They started demanding stuff from God. They had desires. They were craving things. They, they had an agenda. They had stuff they wanted to get done. And, and they started demanding, God, you need to do this for me. You need to bless this for me. I want this. See, what kind of, what kind of attitude is that? You know why they started demanding from God? Because they hadn't been delighting in God. They hadn't been declaring God. And, and, and they thought that, that God saved them to be their slave. And see, if you're, not, if you're not delighting in God on a daily basis, if you're not declaring God on a daily basis, uh, when, when it gets difficult, and it's going to get difficult, life always gets difficult. Notice it says they were in the desert. They were in the desert, and, and when they were in the desert, they started craving stuff. And then they started despising God. They were ungrateful. They started holding God in discontent. They said, yeah, he brought water out of a rock. See, they remembered him, but they didn't remember why. They said, yeah, we know he brought water out of a rock, but can he give us bread? 
What about some meat? We want more stuff. You see, this is the way they did stuff. They were sinning, and they were demanding of God. You know, when you, when you don't desire to live for the demands of God, you wind up demanding that God lives for your desires. And if you, if you have that kind of attitude that you don't want to do what God tells you to do, but you want God to do for you, if he answers your prayer, you should be afraid. It says, keep reading, it says he gave them what they asked for. He gave them the bread, he gave them the meat, but while it was still in their mouth, he killed them. It says he killed the strongest ones among them. He gave them what they craved. Then he put them in their grave. So they were, they were using God. They were using God to bless their desires. They had their own agenda. They had their own desires. Oh God, please bless what I want. Instead of saying, God, make me a blessing the way you want me to be a blessing. Make me someone who delights in you. Make me someone who declares you. That's why they didn't depend on God. We need to depend on God. Depend on God to do in our life, what he wants to do. You know, God has done miraculous things for them. And, 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 and when, you, when you're delighting in those things and when you're declaring those things, when you get in a jam, when, when life gets difficult, you're, you're brought to pray and say, I remember what God did last year. We went through something like this. And I remember how he brought us through it and how he's bringing us through it now. And so I'm going to give praise and honor to the one who, who brought me out of trouble and is bringing me through this trouble. And so... I can trust him for this trouble too because they have been delighting in him. They have been, they have been declaring him. They have been full of him. They have been obsessed with God. They got up in the morning thinking about God. They went to bed dreaming about God. They were addicted to God. It was like a drug to them. That's the way God wants you to be because you have no life apart from him. And he wants you to be drugged up on him. He wants you to drink him. That's what Jesus said. Drink my blood. Eat my flesh. Be addicted to me. That's what Jesus is saying. So they went on, and uh, it says that God, God gave them the meat, but then God destroyed them. And then they had the V8 moment. Then they started remembering God. Then they started seeking God. Then they started repenting. Then they started remembering their rock. But then it immediately says, in verse 36, but they flattered him with their mouths. They lied with their tongues. If the only reason you repent of sin is because you're afraid to die, that's not repentance. That's self-love. You're in love with yourself. You're repenting because you're afraid of the consequences. You're not repenting because you love God. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 1.9 that true repentance means that you turn to God away from idols, for what reason? For the consequences? No, to serve the living God and to wait for his son who comes, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so real repentance means turning to God, turning away from sin to serve God and to seek his kingdom and his righteousness until he comes. That's real repentance and that's not what they had here. But the centerpiece of this psalm in verse 38 is that the only reason Israel kept going, the only reason they didn't cease to exist as a people, is because there was a God, the God, who decided of his own grace to show them compassion. That is the only reason that they continue to exist. He decided to graciously atone for their sin. Notice how this verse comes right after their false repentance to show that salvation is by grace and by grace alone. And so, it says he restrained his anger. He didn't pour out all his wrath, but he remembered they're just flesh. And look at verse 40 and following. They had a scattered history. They often rebelled against him in the wilderness. They grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again. They provoked the Holy One of Israel. Why did they do these things? Keep reading. They didn't remember Egypt. The Bible says they didn't remember what God did in Egypt. He, they didn't remember what, what God did 
with the plagues in Egypt. He starts naming all the plagues. Why on earth would he bring that up? What's that to remember? They didn't remember the plagues and they didn't remember God bringing them into the land. You keep reading and how he, he drove out the nations and settled his people in the land. They didn't remember how he buried the enemies under the sea. Well, what's the point? Well, the reason why God brought the plagues, the reason why God brought them in the land, the reason why God drove out the nations, the reason why God drowned their enemies in the sea is because God was sending a message to the whole world. And the message he was sending is that there is no one in this world like me. That's the message he was sending. Read it in Exodus chapter 9. The reason why God sent the plagues is because he wanted to put on display how powerful he was. Because God wanted to proclaim his name in all of the earth. He brought the plagues because he condemned every other false god. He drove out the nations to condemn the false gods so that everybody in the world would know there is only one single solitary God and it's Yahweh. And there is no other. That was his point. And he brought his people in the land to proclaim those things to the world around them and to demonstrate the, the character that God builds in people because that's who he is. That's why he, that's why he brought them in the land. But, but, but look, at, look, at, look at what it says when they got in the land. In verse 57, it says that even though he, he brought them in the land, it goes back to the illusion of the bow again, the weapon they put down. They turned away and acted treacherously like their fathers. They twisted like a deceitful bow. So they didn't, they didn't proclaim God, but what they did is they started conforming to the nations around them. They started mixing with the multitudes and started acting like the people in this world. They started behaving like they didn't even know the Lord. And they committed idolatry, it says. And the idolatry is talking about, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it's talking about Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, his sons. They were priests. But Hophni and Phinehas, the idolatry is talking about is they were living for themselves. They weren't serving the Lord. They, were, they had contempt for the Lord's offering. And they were living for their own appetites. That was their idolatry. And it says specifically in, in 1 Samuel 2 that the father, uh, Eli, he did not tell his sons they were wrong. It's the father's responsibility. It's your responsibility as you're going to be parents one day. And it's your responsibility to sow the word of God in the hearts of your children. That's your job. That's your calling so that they would sow it in the hearts of their children, your grandchildren. It's something to think about grandchildren when you're only a teenager, isn't it? Well, you've got to plan ahead, see? <laughs> it's always good to plan ahead. You know when you take tests, if you don't plan ahead, you've got to cram. It's hard cramming. <laughs> you don't know what they're going to ask. See, and so, so they got into the land, and, and they, it says, um, as you read the, the last part of the verses here, it says that they twisted like a deceitful bow, and when God heard it in verse 59, it says he was full of wrath. He was hot. And it says that he rejected Israel wholesale. The Ark of the Covenant, the very thing that was his throne and his presence among his people, he sent it out into exile. The Philistines took it. And it says the priests, Hophni and Phinehas and Eli, they all died the same day. He made the Philistines stab Eli or stab uh, Phinehas and Hophni and Eli when he heard that the ark was taken captive, he fell out of his chair and broke his neck. And Phinehas' wife, when she heard, she gave birth. It was so stressful. And she called her child Ichabod. The glory has departed. God himself has departed Israel. Israel was all but done. It seems like their life was over because they weren't devoted to the Lord. We need to be devoted to the Lord. But they weren't. What's going to make you different? Look at verse 65. It says, but then something unexpected happened. It says, God woke up like he was sleeping. He woke up like he was sleeping. He woke up like a strong man who was shouting because of wine. It's like God had a hangover. It's like he had been drinking too much. That's the image it gives. That's not the way we tend to think about God, but, but that's the image he gives of himself. 
that when Israel seemed like they were at their wits end, it's like God woke up like a drunk and he was shouting because of wine. And he was doing things that were unexpected. He was doing stuff you wouldn't expect him to do. He overcame the Philistines. Why do that? Your people sin. They deserve that. But God overcame their enemies. And then God rejected the tent of Joseph. I mean, if anybody could save Israel at this point, it was Joseph. I mean, Joseph, remember, when he was in Egypt, he had the dreams. He saved the day. Everybody got food because of Joseph. If anybody can save us, God, it's Joseph. But God said, I don't want Joseph. He was drinking something. He wasn't thinking like you normally think he was thinking. I don't want Joseph. Then he said, it says he rejected Ephraim. Well, Joshua was an Ephraim. He fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. If anybody can save us, it's Joshua, Lord. But he said, I don't want Joshua. I don't want Ephraim. I want Judah. He said, Judah? Judah was a pervert. He slept with his own daughter-in-law. I mean, he didn't know it was her, but still he thought it was a prostitute. I mean, that's bad. He's the one who sold Joseph into the wilderness, into, the, into Egypt. Why Judah? Because it's about grace. That's why Judah. And he chose, he chose David. I mean, of all the people, David. I mean, what, David's a little runt. I mean, what, what was God drinking? What was he thinking? I mean, he got all of these great superstars in Jesse's family, but Joseph was a little baby. He got rosy cheeks like a girl. He got beautiful eyes like a lady. I mean, he's a little wimp. He's a little shepherd boy. He follows sheep around. I mean, why him? Because it's about grace. God does things that it's not expected. He's been drinking something, you see. And what he's been drinking is the spirit. You know, because it says here in verse 69 that, that what, what God was doing, it says he was building a sanctuary that was eternal. That's what he was into. Remember? He, that's what he wants. He wants a sanctuary, a people who will declare his glory and make his name famous. That's what he wants. He wants an eternal sanctuary. Because ultimately, you and I are no better than Israel. You try to parent children. You try to live life like this. You can't do it. You have no power in yourself to do this. We'll, we'll repeat history if we try. But what's going to motivate you to live this way? Well, what's going to motivate you is, is David's greater son, Jesus Christ. Remember how the psalm talks about this? In chapter 2 of Psalm 78, it says, I will, I will speak to you in parables. I will utter dark sayings. You know where this is quoted again? In Matthew 13, where Jesus gives the parables of the kingdom. It says that he spoke in parables to them to fulfill this very passage in Psalm 78. And so what God is saying is that Jesus himself is the fulfillment of this psalm. You want to be faithful in the covenant with God? You want to be a true delighter, not just putting on a front and acting? You, you want to be a true uh, person who depends on God and declares him and do it from the heart and not just try to force yourself to do it and work it up? You need Jesus Christ. You need the Holy Spirit. Remember, remember the rock that was split in the wilderness that it talks about? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says that that rock was Jesus Christ. When God told Moses, he said, I'm going to stand on the rock next to you, and I want you to hit me. It's a portrait of the crucifixion. And out of the side of Jesus, when he was crucified, came water for the cleansing of the nations and blood. And Jesus cried out on the great day of the feast in John chapter 7. He said, come to me, everybody who is thirsty, and I will give you drink. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is talking, it says, about the Holy Spirit. That's what he's getting at, it says, in John 7, 37 through 39. He's talking about the Spirit of God, and, and God promised his Spirit. He promised to give his Spirit to his people to work in them his will and his, his ways. And so, so you need the Spirit of God. If, if you're a parent today and if you're a father today, you need the Spirit of God. You need Jesus. You need to cry out to Jesus. You remember the parables? He gave parables to separate the sheep and the goat. Remember? He says he gave them parables so that they wouldn't understand. And the people who were his true disciples, they came to him and said, Jesus, I want you to explain this to me. And those who came, he explained it to them and then they got it. And so you've got to be that, that desperate with the word of God. Sometimes you read the Bible, you don't get it, you don't, you don't grasp it, and, but you've got to be desperate. You've got to say, well, God, I need you to explain this to me. I need you to break this down for me. I don't get it. I need the spirit of God to guide me into the truth you're leading me to. And he will, if you go to him, if you seek him, you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart. 
Jesus is that rock. And remember the manna it talks about, how he gave him manna. You know who the manna is. Jesus is the bread of life. He came down from heaven. He said, you have to eat my flesh and you have to drink my blood. But he's not talking about real flesh and real blood. He's not even talking about communion. He's, it says in verse 63 of John 6, he's talking about his word. He's saying, you've got to feed on my word. That's where you're going to abide in me. And when you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit for the kingdom, for the glory of God. Don't you want to bear much fruit? I mean, but does, does, does God have to compete with your desires? I mean, he saved you, right? He, he washed you in his blood. He, he, he rose from the dead for you. Does he have to compete for your desires? I mean, you've got stuff you want to do, but God's got stuff he wants you to do. And, and he's put you in this earth for a reason. And, and are you going to make God compete? Don't make him compete. He's got a right to tell you what to do. He's, 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 he's your God. He, he loves you. He died for you. He rose again. He's preparing a place for you, right? He's in heaven right now interceding for you. He's coming back one day for you. And this is reason to get excited about his purposes in this world for you. You've got to be driven by, by the Lord himself. You remember how it talks about how the glory was captured by the Philistines and taken out of the land. Remember how Jesus was captured by his enemies, the Romans and the Jews, Jewish leaders who didn't believe in him? He was taken to a cross. The glory had departed Israel. He was taken out of Jerusalem and he was crucified there. And then, you know, remember how before he was crucified, he was having supper with his disciples and he said, I'm not going to drink this wine again until I drink it anew in the kingdom with you. Remember that in Luke chapter 21 or 22? He says, I've longed to have this Passover meal with you. And he says, I'm not going to drink again until I drink it anew in the kingdom. And so, yeah, he was taken out. The glory had departed. He was crucified. But then he woke up three days later like a strong man, shouting because of wine. Because he knows that the marriage supper of the Lamb is coming. And there's coming a day when, when you and I are going to sit with Abraham. We're going to sit with Isaac and Jacob and Moses. Daniel's going to be there. Joshua's going to be there. And Jesus is going to be there. There's going to be wine to drink. He is that wine. Will you delight in him today? Will you delight in him? Will you, will you drive, be you driven, be, driven by him? Will you declare him today? Will you depend on him when life gets hard? Will you truly be devoted to the Lord? Will you? Or will you be devoted to an A plus? More than him. Nothing wrong with A+. Plus. But if you got an A+, plus because you didn't read your Bible that week, and you didn't pray that week, that's idolatry. You should be afraid. You should repent. You got an A+, plus, but you didn't fellowship that week. You didn't pray that week. You just prayed for an A+. Plus. But you didn't pray for a clean heart. You didn't pray for lust to be conquered. See, this is about God. It's not about an A+. Plus. It's not about a new car. It's not about a house. It's not about a career. It's not about getting into a particular college. It's about God. It's about Him sowing His Word in you so that He can sow you in this world, so that you can sow His Word in other people's hearts. If you're a father, that's your duty. That's your calling. And nothing you give your children is more important than that. Nothing you can share with your children will ever match that. It's in a category by itself because God is bringing this world to a close one day and he's bringing your life to a close one day. There's a day of separation coming. There's a day of judgment coming and you've got to stand before God by yourself. You've got to give an account for the way you live your life. You've got to give an account for the things you've done, the things you've given yourself to. God's going to, God's going to call you to account for what you devoted yourself to. So you and I, we need to go back to the gospel. We need to go back to the cross. We need to go back to Jesus, and we need to be people who delight in him richly, people who are declaring him richly, and people who are willing to come under his authority and say, Jesus, this life is yours. You made me. You give me breath every day. Why am I here? And he'll tell you why you're here. You're here to seek his word, to have it planted in your heart. You're here to delight in him. You're here to rejoice in him, to seek his kingdom first and his righteousness first. He'll give you all the stuff you need. You may not have the brightest car. You may not have the biggest house, but you'll have a place to stay. He'll give you a place to stay. Well, I get a, I mean, what is a big house? It's going to fall down one day. It may be nice now, but it's going to go to pieces one day. I've got a mansion in glory. It'll never get rusty. It'll never get robbed. It'll never get threatened by wind and wave and storm. It's a mansion that God created himself. 
So we live for, for the we live for the Lord. We live for the day after when he comes back again. We live for the new heavens and the new earth. You give your child something else besides that, and you will be a failure. You give yourself to something more than that, and you will be a failure. I don't care if you get all the A's and, and all the college degrees and all the doctor's degrees and the greatest house and the most, most kids and the beautifulest wife. If you don't know Jesus, you are a failure. You gain the whole world and you lose your own soul. Don't let these things drag you to hell. You do your best, but you put God first. God is first. His name has to be proclaimed. The only way people are going to know is if you tell them you know him, you share with him. Share him with other people. That's your calling. Don't repeat this history. You need the strong man shouting because of wine. You need him in your heart. You need him to change you today. Let's, uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer. I wonder if you would pray silently over these things about that God would really work in your heart if you're serious about this. And you've got to be serious. Israel was not serious. God put him in the grave. Would you pray that God would work in you so that you would delight in him above all things, that you would declare him whenever the opportunity presents itself, that you would depend on him and that you would truly be devoted to him and driven, motivated to live for him. Would you pray that and I'll close in a period of time.